Hello and welcome back to the Wild Hearts at Work podcast. This is your host, Melissa Boggs, and today we're going to talk about play. And I'm so excited to have one of the leading experts on play at work. Um, I feel very, very fortunate. So excited to welcome to the podcast. Ah, to the podcast, Gary Ware, who is a strategic play consultant. I can't wait to hear about how you get that job. Um, and the founder of Breakthrough Play, also a TEDx speaker and has the best background of anyone I've had on the podcast so far, because for those who are listening, Mickey Mouse in your background. Gary, welcome to the podcast. Awesome. Uh, thank you so much, Melissa, for having me and for the listeners out there. What Melissa noticed is my hidden Mickey on my wall. Um, I have a whole bunch of polka dots um, on my <laughs> wall. And as a big Disney fan, I love um, creating like little hidden Mickey moments. And people who are in the know, they know and they spot it instantly. So bravo. Right on it. I was like, oh, I don't miss Mickey. Um, so Gary, let's kick off by just talking about what you do. Tell us all about you and your work because I am fascinated. Yes. So as you mentioned, I am a strategic play consultant and in a nutshell, what that is, I help individuals and companies utilize the power of play and what I call applied improvisation to help them be more creative, help them think on their feet. And at the end of the day, just be the best version of themselves. That sounds like so much fun. <laughs> um, so tell me a little bit about what that looks like in terms of um, like, what do you do with them? Is it workshops? Is it speaking all the above? Yes, it is all of the above. Um, it's interesting because I, when I'm brought in to speak like a keynote or something like that, because of my improv background, I can't help but to get people involved. So anything that uh, involves me and you, there's going to be some sort of interactivity because in my research on play and how play can help us be the best version of ourselves, when you are interacting with something or you know, you're playing, you're going to learn faster. You're going to experience it and it's going to help you actually be able to implement it. You know, compared to I'm just going to speak at you and you're taking notes and you hope that something's going to seep in, uh, seep in. Yeah, absolutely. And it's so funny because, you know, people I'm a trainer and, you know, we get a little bit of grief for some of these like, quote unquote, icebreaker exercises or, you know, nobody wants interactivity until you do it. And then like 30 seconds into the exercise, they're like, oh, this is pretty fun. <laughs> You're, if I could just comment on that, you're absolutely right. And it's one of those things where as, as a trainer, as a facilitator, I like to, you know, set people up and tell them the why, because a lot of times, and I'm just pulling from my own experience. Yeah, we'll do this activity and people are like, well, what's the purpose of this? And it may be like engaging or, or whatever, but if you don't know like why, why it works, it's not going to help you really have that impact. Um, and it just reminds me of growing up. My dad would tell me this story about this mom who made canned ham for Thanksgiving and she did it a certain way. And her daughter asked, why do you do that? And she's like, I don't know. My mom, this is how my mom did it. And when they asked the grandma, the grandma was like, oh my gosh, you do it that way. Um, <laughs> I only did it that way because we didn't have a, a pan big enough to fit the canned ham, you know? And so it was just one of those things that sometimes we do things just because is how it's been done. And we don't even know why do we even do that? And so as a trainer, as a facilitator, I like to just let people know what is the purpose of this? You know, if we're going to, regardless if it's virtual or in person, if we're doing some sort of icebreaker, I like to let them know, hey, this is to warm you up so that you are going to be more likely to receive the information that we're about to do. Or this is to help us get to know each other a little bit better so that when we get to the challenging stuff, you're going to be more likely to be more vulnerable because, hey, guess what? You know, we, we've taken the time to do that. Sure. I mean, it it unlocks something in you, right? And especially if you say the why, like you said, if you can prepare people um, 
it, it unlocks some vulnerability that makes it possible for you to do everything else in the workshop. Um, what else have you found that it unlocks? Uh, have you had any surprising moments in workshops, different emotions that show up that you didn't expect? Yes. So as far as, you know, the whole like sort of um, play thing, when you bring it up in a work environment, um, I've seen that people are more likely to embrace uncertainty. Mm. That's like a big thing, especially in our current climate where there is so much uncertainty. Helping people experience that in a low stakes environment is crucial to like the bigger picture. So that's a big thing that I that I've seen. The other thing is that the the whole collaboration piece and it's so interesting so again you talk about this a lot there's one thing in theory <laughs> and on paper and then in practice right uh so they talk about yes play is all about you know uh when you are in a play like experience you're going to uh collaborate better you're going to see people in a different light and I've, I've read that i've read it over and over again but it wasn't until i started doing these workshops where i had these different segments of people do these playful activities that had one specific purpose. And then later on asking them like, Hey, how do you, how do you think this affected you? Like, what are you learning? And, and hearing something that blows my mind, I'm like, Oh my gosh, this is some powerful stuff. Case in point, I was doing an intergenerational workshop. So in this case, we were bringing people of various ages and we're doing playful um, improv based activities. And the purpose here is to allow them to connect with each other and have an experience with other uh, generations so that they can see them in a different light, have more empathy, you know, etc. And then also because of the pandemic. So this these workshops are in a virtual environment. Because of the pandemic, a lot of people felt isolated and alone. This is a great way to have them connect. And then in this workshop, we happen to have people of different nationalities, you know, uh, we had some people from India, we had some people from the Philippines, some people Canada, US, it just was the just this workshop, you know, and it, we didn't necessarily expect that to happen, but it happened. And then afterwards, we're doing the, the debrief, and we're, you know, people are checking out what are the things that they got from it. And there was this, um, this older gentleman, um, older white gentleman from the US, he had mentioned, wow, I am really realizing my privilege. Hmm. I didn't realize this prior, but having these conversations, doing these activities made me realize that, yes, I'm extremely privileged and I had never really seen that before. That was not our intention. However, when you are in a play like state, you are increasingly vulnerable. You're very vulnerable. You're allowing your just true nature to come out. You're having these conversations with people that are, you know, in our workshops that are that have different perspectives. But because it's a safe environment, because we are playing, you're going to be more likely to just be open and just receive. And so this gentleman uh, specifically had some conversations with uh, people, you know, in other countries that he probably wouldn't have had any other, you know, time and and heard their stories firsthand from them. And it, it really moved him. And it, it was like, wow, such a powerful experience. It's amazing. I mean, there's this abstraction that happens, right? That like allows that those walls to come down a little bit. I mean, you mentioned vulnerability. I'm just sort of maybe phrasing it in a different way. Like yeah. I'm removed from it. This is safe. This is not going to, you know, affect X, Y, and Z, but you don't even know what's happening. I think that's what I've sort of realized. I, mm -hmm kind of incorporate play in some of my work too. And it's like, they don't even know that that's what's happening. And it's not that we're trying to trick them by any stretch, but just it's a natural, like, oh, this is play like when I was a kid. So, you know, it's separate from all my quote unquote work stuff. Um, but yet it doesn't take very long, like you just said at the end, for those connections to click and for it to be like, oh, 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 I see, <laughs> right? Um, I'll share a very quick story, uh, real quickly, um, at a former organization where I had the privilege to lead, we completely upended our interview process. I hate traditional interviewing. I hate that you spend six hours with six different people putting on your best face. That may not be the face that you bring to work every day, or even the face that you want to have. 
so we actually designed um, an interview process of play um, based on Richard Sheridan's uh, extreme interviewing, but I did take it a step further. And so we um, had like an entire day where we actually brought all the candidates at one time. Everyone came together and we all played together. And the thing about it was you cannot fake it. Like you cannot fake who you are and the communication skills and the ability to trust and all of that when you're playing with blocks, which is what we were doing uh, among other things. And so just to share that, like I experienced that abstraction where it was like, and people came out of it going, this was the weirdest interview I've ever had, but I felt like I was the most myself. Um, so I think that's just it. Like play allows you to be your most authentic self because you don't even like have the, I don't even know what the word is. You don't have the inclination to fake something because you're just playing. Yes. And this is the beauty of play. And you're absolutely right. We're not trying to trick people. It's just the nature of play. Your brain suspends your belief, your normal belief structure for the rules of the game. Take, for example, golf. Golf, if you look at what happens in golf, golf is ridiculous. And it's not <laughs> an effective way of doing something. You are taking a stick. And the objective of the game is to use a stick to hit a tiny ball into a hole <laughs> hundreds of yards away. That is, like, ridiculous, you know. That's not an effective way of doing it. However, you suspend normal belief for the rules of the game. And you're playing golf and, you know, it's enjoyable for some, you know, whatever the case may be. And then after the game's over, then you go back to, like, sort of regular life. And that's how it is with play. And when you're in a play-like state, because to truly play, you have to be invited. Yes, there are some things where people were forced to do it, and maybe they may, like, do it un willingly and then one of the cool things is because it's a pleasurable experience because they're seeing other people the people that usually have the arms crossed after a while they do let their guard down and they truly play because it's something that you can't fake and yeah it, it's 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 so beautiful and then the other thing because of the positive emotions that are happening during it you are having this association with everything around um it's called a peak emotional experience you're, you know, your body's releasing dopamine, um, you know, uh, endorphins, serotonin, all those things that are making you feel like you belong, that things are safe, all the, like, all the, the warm and fuzzies. And then when you look back, you said, wow, that was enjoyable. And guess what? I did it with this person and I had fun. And this unconscious is all happening in the background. I must like them. <laughs> <laughs> because why would I why would I do something unless I trust and like them? And then you start to have this affinity. Mm. And I can imagine what that brings back to the workplace, right? Like I can imagine, and let's just say for a moment that you, you know, you did that on a Friday. Gary came in on a Friday, we had a really cool workshop. And in the moment, I probably just think, oh, we just had a fun workshop and I'm going to go home. But the next week, I'm in a meeting with someone who maybe I didn't dislike them before. I just didn't really know them. And so I was maybe a little bit ambivalent. And now I'm in a meeting with them and they're proposing a new idea. How differently am I going to look at them, you know, even subconsciously in that moment? You're absolutely right. You yeah. <laughs> and and again, I read the research and it wasn't until like I actually put it into practice that I see it happen. And at, because a lot of this is happening unconsciously, when I do workshops, I want to make sure that you are aware of what's happening. So I don't like to leave things up t for chance. So when we're done, after all the magic's happened, it's like one of these like m m uh, murder mystery type things where we like go back and like, <laughs> oh, Kaiser so say, you know, X, Y, and Z. Like I go and like help them connect the dots mm -hmm. so that they can see, oh, that's why I'm feeling this. And then I invite them to say, with this new information, what are you going to consciously work on as a result? Love that. So that they can start to put some 
some things into practice. And I tell them, look, it's not going to be perfect. <laughs> but it, if you can start to see it, then there's a possibility. Mm -hmm. Yep. So are there any risks? Of course. There's lots of risks. Uh, play is messy. <laughs> Play, like, if think about anything that you've done, um, you know, there's lots of mistakes that potentially can happen. However, I feel like the risks um, are minimal compared to the upside. So if if it's not administered, uh, administered, yeah, I think that's the correct word, uh, correctly, and you're not creating this safe environment, yeah, there's a risk of people sort of going along with it, but not really all in because they don't feel safe. Mm -hmm. Um, but to, to be honest, you know, it, as a facilitator, it's my job to understand the outcomes, understand who, who we, who are we dealing with and create an environment where we can, you know, sort of jump into that, into that play space and, and explore together. Now, because of the nature of this work and because we're like, you know, being like our sort of childlike selves, sometimes people cross the line. And what I like to say, and this is why I like to have like agreements up front of one of which is, you know, make your partner look amazing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, take care of yourself. If there's a situation, I tell people, if there's a situation where you don't feel safe or you don't feel comfortable, you have permission to, you know, take a step back, speak up. And if I can rewind the clock, when we were younger and we overstepped someone's boundaries, you know, kids are quick to speak up <laughs> and, <laughs> and then we, we adjust and we, so I feel like in these play like situations, we are going to, yes, it's messy. We're going to make mistakes, but we're going to learn fast and we're going to feel comfortable speaking up because we have that psychological safety like if someone you know we're, we're playing like maybe like a, a storytelling game and someone says something that's a little bit inappropriate again sometimes that happens when you're forcing people to you know speak on their feet as a facilitator it, it's my job once you spot those and say hey time out and it's not we're not doing the blame game or trying to shame someone but saying hey what is another thing that we could have said let's rewind the clock let's try it again all right how was that? And then just acknowledging, you know, hey, such and such, you know, or or like if, if it's just one person, I may not call them out. But I'm like, uh, I might use the collective we. I'm like, you know, there's it might be a few people that might be a little bit uncomfortable with that, that sort of language or, or, you know, let's try something else. And again, a lot of times because it just sort of happens, people are like, oh, you know what? I'm sorry. All right. Yeah. Sorry. Whereas not calling it out, sometimes people are like. Oh, wow. And then it then it can sort of build up and things like that. So, yeah, uh, pl play is risky. Play is messy. However, um, if done right and, you know, if we're all open, we can make those major breakthroughs and we can sort of overcome any sort of barriers. So I recognize some of the improv rules from what you just said. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about the influence of improv on your work and maybe some of those rules that you bring yes. in um, specifically for the folks who are listening, who, Oh, maybe I want to like go learn some of this so I can bring in play too. Yes. So for me, I don't have a, well, I guess I, I've been doing this for over a decade. So I do have a background in theater now. When I first took an improv class, I had no background in theater. My background is in marketing communications. And I took an improv class as a way to become a better speaker. I took Toastmasters and, oh my gosh, that just wasn't my jam. It was so stressful. I felt like I was being judged. I came out every time like, oh my gosh. And I didn't feel like it was me. I felt like I was being the version that they wanted me to be. I wasn't being my true self because that in my, for me personally, it didn't feel like play. And again, at that point, I really didn't know much about play, but it just was not an enjoyable experience. I dread it going every time. And then, so I was like, there has to be something else. And a mentor of mine said, Hey, why don't you take an improv class? And I was like, what improv? And so I took, you know, I, I took their advice. You know, when you have someone that you 
know, like, and trust, and they suggest something that might be a little bit outside of your comfort zone, you know, you, you, you just, you just do it. You, you, you see the fear, you recognize the fear and you do it anyway. And that was me. I took that class. There were 15 other people just like me. And we essentially played for, for two hours at a time, um, learning the things that improvisers use on stage to allow them to create something without a script. And there are these guidelines that allow us to do that. And it, I like to say, once you know something, it's kind of hard to unknow that. Um, and these principles that we were practicing over and over again, I couldn't just turn that off once I left the stage. It just sort of became who I was. And I started applying these, you know, in my everyday life. And then it became like an unconscious thing. And then when I started doing the work, I started being intentional about bringing these principles. And some of these principles are like what I mentioned, make your partner look amazing. Um, when we're on stage, because we're making everything up, if you're just, oh, I'm going to try to be funny, you might do something that is going to, um, you know, throw your partner off. And, and how can you co-create a story if um, you're not thinking about them? So making your partner look amazing puts a conscious effort to what can I do to support? How can I help this person? And again, it has huge ramifications in real life, in a team environment, um, especially if you're like in sort of client services sort of situation, you know, and, and it all about compassion and empathy. So that's a big one. The other thing that I, you know, as far as agreements is active listening in improv because it's all made up. And this is a big challenge prior to taking an improv class. I thought I was a good listener. Turns out, no, I wasn't. <laughs> because when we started doing these activities, I realized that I was only listening just a little bit, just enough to get my point across. And then I tune out or I get in my head and then someone will say something and it will trigger a thought. And then before I know it, I'm like nodding and agreeing. And I'm like, I have no idea what they're saying. Uh, and so improv and the practice of improv helped me to stay focused, stay present, and not just listen to the words. Listen to the meaning behind the words. What's the body language? All of that stuff. And th that's, again, huge ramifications uh, when applied outside of the theater. And the other thing, and this is, if you've heard of improv, you, you probably heard of this, is this concept called yes and. And what that basically means on stage is when a scene partner says something, you agree by saying yes, and then you and, and you add something. Uh, because when you say no, you stop the flow of information. You stop the story. And first and foremost, outside of the stage, a lot of times we're, we're quick to say no for whatever reason. Maybe it's fear. Maybe we have another idea. And in work, that's why you have these meetings that feel like we're just going in circles because no one's listening. No one's supporting each other. Someone throws out an idea. Someone says, no, I have another idea. And we are being childish, not childlike. And so yes and is a big thing as far as supporting each other and building. Now, uh, years into this work, I realized that – so doing yes and really helped me sort of get outside my comfort zone because I was that no person. You know, if it was comfortable, I'll say yes. But uh, everything else, no, no, no. But then I realized you can't always say yes, but you can always yes and. And what I mean by that is yes and is acknowledging – and building, mm -hmm. acknowledging what was said, acknowledging the person, and then building off of it. So if someone says, uh, you know, suggests something that is not possible for whatever reason, we are quickly like sort of dismissing it in our head and then, you know, doing something else. And then they don't feel like they're heard. So yes, and is acknowledging them. Hey, I hear you. This is not possible because of X, Y, and Z. Let's think of something else. Yes, and also in practice is acknowledging the environment that we're in and still working with it. Again, mm -hmm. we're, as of this recording, we're still sort of dealing with this global pandemic thing. And it's not something that anyone had planned or, you know, wanted to deal with, but here we are. And so we have to accept it and build. So those are just three, 
improv principle. There's a, a whole list. Uh, we can have a whole another episode uh, episode on improv principles and the Zen of improv. But you know, just to get people started, these are things that work on the stage and work off of the stage. Yes, I I heard balance, servant leadership, compassion, empathy, active listening. I mean so many of the things that we bring into the workplace and we're trying to work really hard on, maybe we just need to play really hard at them. <laughs> maybe that gets us further, right? Agreed. Um, and so, yes, I want to go to the pandemic for a minute since you brought that up. Um, I will yes and that. I was going to do it more subtly and then I just went, yes and. Um, <laughs> I have to imagine, especially in this vir virtual world, that um, it's hard to help people get into a place of play right now, but when they do, it pays off. <laughs> and so can you tell me what you've experienced in your work um, just in the last 18 months and how maybe it's been different? Yes, you're absolutely right. <laughs> uh the reason is, and just to dive deeper on like a psychological, physiological level, when we are experiencing stress, we cannot play because those mm -hmm. are two different parts of the brain. When we're in stress mode, we are activating uh, the sympathetic nervous system. Um, that's the fight, flight, or freeze. Um, that we're in their limbic system or lizard brain, and it's all about survival. Play is one of those things that you know, the, like you, because of the vulnerability of it, when you are faced with a threat, you can't play. You have to deal with the, you know, the threat at hand, the stressor that is uh, happening. This is the challenge though. This is something that is ongoing. It's not mm -hmm. like a tiger just jumped out of, uh, out of the, the brush and we have to deal with it right now, either like fight, you know, run away or whatever the case may be. This is something that is ongoing and it, and if you stay in that stress mode, you are depleting all of your sort of uh, immune system and all these resources, your ability to be creative, um, your ability to be empathetic and all these things. And, you know, it, it will make you sick. Uh, there's so many negative uh, ramifications for it. So play, like you said, it is it's one of these. A conundrums where it's an anecdote, but yet we don't feel like doing. It. And so it's, it's a, it's a challenge. And so in my work that I found, especially at the beginning of the pandemic, when we didn't know what was going on, I, you know, all of my work was canceled because mm -hmm. prior to the pandemic, everything I did was in person. So I just started doing these drop-ins, weekly drop-ins, you know, pay what you can, um, and it one, it allowed me to practice some of these things in a virtual environment. Uh, and two, it allowed me to help people just turn off everything that's going on for just a brief moment. I just and want it, to share real quick, sorry, before yeah, you please. go on, yes. the impact of that. Like I literally just felt relief. Like in you saying that, I really just had a moment of like, <sighs> yes. wow. That was pretty impactful just to hear you say it out loud and we're not even playing. Okay, right, carry not on. Not even playing. But yes, but so that's the thing. And that's what I found that, you know, for me to say, we need to play, we need to play, like that is being like sort of delusional because when you see all this stuff going on, you're not going to want to play. But I do know that we do need interruptions. We need a few breaks to give us the strength to go on and so i call these like little mini power-ups and the interesting thing is i started calling it a rebellion <laughs> a playful rebellion in that we had to rebel against our sort of adult self that feels like oh well no i i need to work 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 you know it's irresponsible and do something that in the long run is going to help us fight the long fight and so i said you know i would tell people you know hey, let's rebel. We're going to rebel through play. And guess what? This little play break, you know, 30 minutes to an hour is going to give you enough sort of energy to jump back in whatever you're doing um, 
because we're turning off the limbic system, getting you back into the prefrontal cortex, the creative process of, of your brain so that you can be creative and think of solutions. And the interesting thing was uh, so many people are like, wow, this is great. I got so into it that I neglected to take care of myself and I burnt myself out. Um, and there's like this thing, I don't know the technical term, but I think it's like sort of like a caregiver syndrome where when you go into that caregiver mode and then you like, you know, a lot of teachers and, and nurses and doctors and stuff like that, you forget about yourself uh, for a brief moment and that happened and then come, uh, it was like March and then I blinked and it was June and then I blinked and then it was August and then I was like, what happened? Um, and that's a whole, again, a whole nother story. But for the people who were doing it, they're like, wow, this is, this is awesome. This is great. Um, and then there was some research that came out from Microsoft that that showed because of the pandemic, because everyone was you know, working from home, they didn't have those sort of, at the time, we thought them as waste of time, like commuting and all these other things. But those things were necessary because they didn't have that. They were going from meeting to meeting and then they were all on video calls and we we're doing things that aren't normal, like nece like like normal for us to look at ourselves for hours on end. Uh, they found that the, the brains were like fried. <laughs> you know, by the end of the day, the brains are like just completely stressed out. But they found that people that took breaks in between, it was like their brain was uh, revitalized between every meeting. And so that's where I was telling people, I said, look, you need these breaks. If if you if you feel bad calling it play, call it self-care. Do whatever it is, but you need to take these breaks and it's going to give you the ability to power through. Um, you know, play is better, uh, but you know, you don't have to call it play to reap the benefits of, of you know, and I, I think this is one of the things where I started talking about joy. Uh, but yeah, that was a big thing for me. Oh, we're definitely going to talk about joy in 0.5 seconds. Um, compassion fatigue. I think that's what you're referring to. Um, compassion fatigue. And I also just want to mention before we switch subjects, there is a book uh, called Burnout, Unlocking the Stress Cycle, uh, Emily Nagoski. And it, it helps me really understand burnout because I think we all tend to think that burnout it's like, oh, I'm just tired. And if I take a three-day weekend, I'll be fine. And you hit on it. And I just wanted to sort of re-highlight it and mention this book because she talks about how it's, first of all, it's not just tiredness. There's like a whole bunch of things that are involved in burnout, like lack of control and, you know, lack of autonomy, not even just from a work perspective, but like the pandemic, you know, removed some of our autonomy, which puts your brain in this constant fight or flight. And so you need this ability, like you said, to resolve that. And, you know, it made me think when you were talking about how, like, we had, you know, PE when we were kids. And yes, that's exercise. But now I'm thinking, oh, actually, whether it was intentional or not, maybe it was. Maybe our teachers knew what they were doing. Um, but it was also, like, resolving some of that. Like, your body... She talks about how, like, you know, cavemen, so to speak, were being chased by... Uh, oh gosh, what is it called? Not bison. Uh, I don't know, the big animals, you know, they're chasing you. When they're chasing you, like the tiger that you mentioned, when it's gone, your body knows that this is resolved. But in work or pandemic, your body never has that signal unless you like give it something to like finish. So play being one of those things that we can finish. So anyway, that book was amazing. Um, I think I've probably talked about it on the podcast before. It's a little bit slanted toward um, uh, folks who identify as women, but I honestly don't, I mean, there's just pieces of it for the most part. I think it applies to everyone. Um, so I'll put a link to that in the show notes. Let's talk about joy though. Um, you have a blog on your website about like happiness versus joy. We both are big fans of Rich. I don't know how many times I'm going to mention Rich Sheridan on this podcast, but um Talk to me about the difference for you between happiness and joy. Yes. So for the longest time, you know, uh, again, don't get me wrong. I, I love positive psychology. I'm a big fan of it. I I feel like that was also a catalyst for me of, of going down this path. Um, but there was something about the word happiness that 
it just didn't sit with me right like um and then as i started digging deeper for me personally i felt like happiness is ex like external i got something it made me happy you know i i bought a new car it made me happy i did this and and then that happiness starts is fleeting and then i started looking into joy and joy is for me what i found was internal joy didn't always like it wasn't always um uh easy mm -hmm. but the result was lasting like so for example one of the things that i i don't even know where i got this from but i did it and i'm happy that i did it was i said you know i want to run a half marathon i prior to this i had never run more than a 5k but something in me said, you know what, I, I want to see if I can do it. And if you've ever run a half marathon or run any sort of distance and or trained for it, there's stuff that you have to do. Those things aren't easy. Matter of fact, they're very challenging. And in the moment, sometimes I'm like, what did I get myself into? Why did I do it? <laughs> However, afterwards, there's this like joy that hits you. It's like, wow. I did that. That feels very good. It's like a, a sense of gratitude. And so for me, I stopped using happiness and I started using joy. What are things that are going to bring me a sense of joy? And that is one of the things with, with play that I really loved is that something about the act of doing it, it's good enough. Mm. Say that one more time. Something about the act of doing it is good enough. And that's what I love about play is that you just get immersed in it. And yeah, you know, that that's the reward, you know, uh, of doing it. And for me, from a mindset standpoint, how can you, and this is why I love the work uh, of Rich Sheridan, like how can you see the work that you're doing as play, as something that is bringing you joy and there's a challenge to it and you know you're solving something um it's not necessarily inherently easy but you see the bigger picture and so that that for me is why i'm i'm a big fan of joy and it is you know something that you know uh, i'm i'm on that joy train you know to the cows come home choo choo um your own joy so you already mentioned the half marathon what else um what else brings you joy? Yes. And this is something I ask people all the time because you're right. You said your own joy. It is something that is very personal that that maybe there other people might share in that. But for you, you know, there is, you know, something about it. And I know there have been major milestones in my life where I've felt a challenge. And the thing that's got me through it is spending time doing something that brought me probably brought me joy more when I was a kid, but I found a way to incorporate it as an adult. And so um, something as of recent, well, when I was a kid, I was 11, um, I got a magic kit. Um, and I thought it was so cool to do a little magic trick and and see people's like delight of like, oh, what happened? Like to do something that my mom and dad are like, what did you do? Like that, like brought me a lot of joy. And then again, as you get older, like it wasn't something that like I sort of kept with and it sort of went away. And then I found myself, uh, especially during the pandemic, you know, can't really go out, you know, I, I'm not performing on stages and I just wanted something. I don't know, just something, something to take my mind off of it. And then I always ask myself, what is something that I did when I was younger that I probably am not doing now that I can do for just a little bit at a time. And it was magic. And I, and I said, I want to be, I want to, my pandemic hobby is to be a bad magician. <laughs> and, <laughs> and again, I think in the, 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 the book about a burnout, I think they, cause it's been a while since I read it, but I think they, they talked about, um, you know, expectations. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so reason why I said a bad magician is that my goal wasn't to like be on stages and do all these things. That wasn't it. It was just to do something just for the sake of doing it. 
and I love magic. Uh, I hadn't practiced magic or done anything like that um, in quite some time. So I went and uh, happened to like, you know, get like a few little magic tricks and I would just like practice them. And again, why I said a bad magician is that I wasn't trying to be inherently good at it. I just wanted to just do it. And again, I'm setting the bar super low. <laughs> uh super low um uh, just so i can just allow myself to enjoy it because i feel like as an adult we have this need to be really good at something yeah and yep, so yep. you know and, and then when we're not that that like we give up on it and again for me the whole point was to just have something to just uh get lost in and have a lot of fun with and so yeah i would do these like little magic tricks um and they were silly and then I started uh, incorporating, I'm trying to see if I have something. I, I don't, unfortunately, but it's all good. Um, I started incorporating it into my work. Um, again, not doing a magic show or anything like that, but I because I'm doing these things on camera and I want it to be engaging. For example, I did a workshop on burnout. I did this um, effect where I uh, poured um, this can of a soda into a cup and I said, this is you pouring yourself into your work. And then I said, when you're done, you're, you're burnt out. And I crushed the can. And, and then I said, you expect your work. And I pointed to the cup to give you life. And I tried to pour the cup back into the can and the cup was empty. And, mm. and then, and then people were like, oh, and ready, again, to go. ready to go. And, and that delight that happened when I was 11. Um, and so that, again, the, the whole point that brought me joy. And it's just something for me. Um, and I have to remind myself, it's an ongoing practice of it's not, to get attention. Um, and you know, it is just something for me and someone that I really admire, um, is, uh, a gentleman, his name is Brad Montague. Um, he has, uh, this book, um, uh, being better grownups, I think, oh, becoming better grownups. Um, if anyone has ever seen kid president back in the day, he was the creator of that. Um, and he said, do something out of love, not for love. Ooh, say that one one more time. Do something out of love, not for love. And a lot of times we do things because we want that gratification. You know, we want that like, hey, look at me, you know, sort of thing. And I said, no, I'm just doing this um, out of love. This is something that, you know, brings me joy. I'm doing it out of love, not for love. And so, yeah, there we go. Yeah, that resonates a lot. Um, it's funny that you mentioned the thing about magic and during the pandemic, because I've seen so much of that, so much of, of we adults. And I think a particularly, um, maybe in the sort of middle age generation, there are a lot of obviously terrible things that happened during the pandemic, but I think there are many of us that because of everything was going on, we found ourselves, you know, I think it's hard to get people to play at work, but yet at home, we were trying to find ways to play. And so for me, I started roller skating in January for the first time in 20 years. And, but what was funny about that is there's an entire group on Facebook of people just like me who skated like through high school and then stopped and then got back into it literally around January. It was as if that was the moment that we were like, okay, it's been nine months we're going to have to figure out a way through this, you know? And like you said, like for me, adjusting expectations, it took me probably like I could skate right off the bat. I could, I remembered how to do it. It was like riding a bike, but I had so much anxiety about like, like being around other people, especially when we were still masking. And my only expectation of myself was like, just skate, just skate. Like you don't have to achieve anything. Just navigate and don't fall. And I mean, that helped me through, you know, and then it got worse again and I was skating outside. Just skate. Don't trip on the sidewalk, you know? And so, yeah, there's something really powerful. Now, as time went on, like now I've started to kind of level up, but very naturally, like I'm not setting goals, I'm just doing it for the love of it. So I just, I really resonate with that a lot. Um, so as we wrap up, um, how can people find you if people want to work with you now? Cause like I do, um, you know, how do they find you? How do they connect with you? Um, and what do you have going on? If you have any events coming up or, you know, anything you want to share? Yes. Well, if, 
listening to this, if you're like, wow, this is really interesting, you want to learn more, you can go to my website, BreakthroughPlay.com. Uh, I have a number of different musings and, and, and things where I, you know, talk about my sort of philosophy around play. Um, and you can sign up for my newsletter because I don't have it coming up, but I will be having it. Um, I will be having it in probably by the beginning of the year. I do a 30 day play challenge where I invite adults uh, to to play for 30 days. But it's not like, hey, go out and play. I we incorporate these sort of virtues that help you to reactivate your play drive. And, you know, some of it's all about, you know, what can you do at work? What can you do at home? And so, yeah, if you want to find out the next time I do that, you know, sign up for my newsletter. And I'm really scared saying this out loud, but I'm going to say this is, believe it or not, Melissa, you are the first person, first podcast that I'm going to mention that I'm working on a book. And yes, the book is called The Playful Rebellion. And, um, and it's all about that about how I and my story of rebelling against my adult self to become a more playful individual. So uh, that um, as of this recording, we are working on edits. Um, So again, I expect it to be out in 2022. So it's very scary to say that out loud, because when you work on something so personal like that, uh, to, you know, to, to say it, you know, it, it makes it real. But yes, so if you if you're curious, yeah, go to my website. And then also, if you want to chat more about it, I'm on LinkedIn. Um, if, if you're on that platform, feel free to hit me up. I'm on other social medias as well. Amazing. I just met you, Gary, but I'm so proud of you. Because oh, even just you. starting a book is, you know, gratifying, joyful, terrifying. I mean, all of the above. So that's so incredible. I feel very honored that you shared it on our podcast first. Um, So with that, thank you for everything. Thank you for your insights. Thank you for sharing your knowledge and your stories. You have such incredible stories. I feel like I could go on for two more hours, so I might have to have you come back in the future. Um, But with that, yeah, thank you for being on the podcast. We really appreciate you. Yeah, thank you for having me. I really appreciate being on here, Melissa. And yeah, uh, if one person was helped by what I said, then I did my job. Amazing. Well, with that, listeners, thank you so much for joining us again this week. If you enjoyed it, like, share, subscribe, go look up Gary. And uh, we have a Patreon now. So if you're interested in supporting the show, the operations that go into you know keeping this thing going, check out the Patreon. There's merch, which is feels weird. I say that every week right now, but it does feel weird to have merch. Um, But lastly, until next time, dear hearts, stay wild.